Homer it is, and we're going to explore certain ideas in Homer. We're not going to, of course, try to summarize the entire work. I'm going to assume that we're familiar with the story so that we can play on another level. I would like to present two quotes to give us a direction. Now, the Odyssey is 24 <coughs> chapters. And the, oh, the Odyssey, the, the Odyssey of Odysseus, is summarized in chapter 9, 10, 11, and 12. What most people regard as the Odyssey of Odysseus covers this four books of the 24. Equally well, as you look at the structure of the work, the work is broken up exactly in half. The first 12 chapters is the journey and the struggle to Ithaca, which Odysseus is home. And once he arrives there in the 13th chapter to the 24th is the struggle in Ithaca. So it has that very interesting point. Now, there is an interesting section right here before Odysseus recalls his voyages and his struggles when he's with the Phaeacians, and that's at the conclusion of book eight. Right. Then there is a reflection both of the Odyssey and of the Iliad in 24, the concluding chapter. And I'd like to take a, a, a few minutes to look at those two reflections, one eight and one at 24. Eight is significant, of course, because he's with the Phaeacians, who are the people that are going to give him the means to return to Ithaca, and allows the Phaeacians to hear the whole journey of Odysseus. And equally well in 24, it's a recollection of the Iliad and the Odyssey, summarily. So here we have two interesting quotes. The book eight quote, includes book eight, where Homer is saying, all the gods work, all the gods work, actually it's all the gods themselves, all the gods work themselves, is weaving ruin there in Troy. This is all dealing with Troy. And the episode in Troy is the Iliad. So here we have a very interesting quote, which I'll give you the whole thing now. He's asked by um, Alkinos, the king of the Phaeacians, why he's so disturbed, why he is so much caught up in the suffering of his story. He says, tell me why you should grieve so terribly over the Argives and the fall of Troy. That was all God's work, weaving ruin there, so it should make a song for men to come. That's the purpose. Right. That's the purpose, in Homer's eyes, of the entire work of the Iliad, so that the gods then should make a song for men to come. That's the purpose. Right. It's for men. It's a story for mankind to learn from. Right. Just, right. So, and the opening lines, of course, of the Iliad is, sing, right? Oh, sing, goddess, the ruinous wrath that brought upon Achaeans innumerable woes, right? Now, in chapter 24, all of the souls of the suitors are descending into Hades, and Agamemnon meets them there as they're passing through, and he talks to each of them. Many of them, that is to say, since they're 180, doesn't talk to them all singularly. But 
In this reflection, which is going back and includes all of the Iliad, the Odyssey on 24, we have a very wonderful statement of Agamemnon. And he reflects, he reflects on himself and on Odysseus, and he says, now Agamemnon's the sh it's a shade in Hades. But Agamemnon's tall shade, when he heard this cry aloud, O oh, fortunate Odysseus, master, mariner, and soldier, blessed son of Lord Laertes, the girl you brought home made a valiant wife one true to her husband's honor and her own, too. Penelope, Icarius' faithful daughter, the very gods themselves will sing her story for men on earth, a mistress of her own heart, Penelope, see. What is it? Hey, the whole story is being sung as a... The very gods will sing her song. The very gods themselves, themselves, will sing her story for men on earth. That's the conclusion. The whole story. Now, the Iliad, therefore, all the gods' work, weaving, ruining there, so it should make a song for men to come it's going to be considered as so significant that they're going to try to discover something significant about this event. And the gods are playing an active role in it so that it can come out the way in which it can be used as this curious thing called a song. The very gods themselves will sing her story for men on earth. And you can see why they think so highly of her, because she is the heroine of the story. And then he contrasts Penelope with Clytemnestra and says, that song will uh, be forever hateful, a bad name she gave to womankind, even the best. So, the, so in the end, the reflection is not on Odysseus. Odysseus is not, they're not going to sing about Odysseus. Primarily, they're going to sing about Penelope. So now look here, that's interesting. The entire work is about women, the role of women, the significance of women in that entire story. That is the Odyssey. And it's on that basis that I'd like to now jump into the work and we can talk about it. Now, of course, these three and these three play a central role through the whole story. Zeus, Poseidon, Athena. And Poseidon only plays a role up to the journey to Ithaca. After that, of course, he no longer has any domain. He gives up his need for vengeance and revenge. And the role actually is passed on to Porky. Porky is the god of the inland seas. So Poseidon controls the sea itself, and uh, Porky controls the inland seas. So. Zeus plays the major role, Poseidon and Athena, through the entire story, with Poseidon, of course, with playing the first part. Odysseus plays a role in the entire story, of course, Penelope and Telemachus. Through this entire drama, the thing that repeats itself again and again is that they are being tested. They test one another, they test one another, the gods test them, and depending upon how they pass that test, so the rest of the story unfolds. So the entire story is testing one another, and how the gods test and wait until they, they are tested. Now, last, here at the beginning of chapter 13, then, he finally gets home in Ithaca, and Athena says, now I shall make you see the shape of Ithaca. 
while she lands him in Porky's Cove, and, and Porky's Cove is an interesting place that is completely familiar to Odysseus. There's a mist covering it, but he knows the entire area. So this can't be taken literally, because he knows it. Well, what does it mean to, to make you see the shape of Ithaca? Well, if we can unpack that, we might be able to understand a little bit more about this story, because the features that take place in the 13th chapter, in the description of Ithaca, right here, 13th chapter, many of the same themes return at the end of the story in chapter 23 and 24, but essentially 23. Now, I'd like to start once now with a couple of opening statements about Zeus. Why is this a story that concerns mankind? In the very opening book of the Odyssey, Zeus looks down and he says, you know, we are in a frightful state. And he says two things that I find quite interesting that we can deal with. I'm going to take the first one. He looks at mortals and he says, my word, how mortals take the gods to task. All their afflictions come from us, we hear. And what of their own failings? Greed and folly doubling, double the suffering and the lot of man. And then he uses one example again and again and again. And that is Agamemnon's story and how he was slain by Aegisthus on his return from Troy. Now, that episode between Agamemnon, Orestes, and Aegisthus is mentioned at least 15 times in the story. Therefore, Zeus is meditating. He's meditating at that time, the beginning of the story. There he is, meditating on the plight of Agamemnon. And how Agamemnon, who was the general at the war in Troy, came home and he was slain on his uh, arrival at home by Aegisthus. And Orestes, then the son, had to come and uh, get revenge for that terrible deed. Zeus is contemplating that. That's what concerns him. Let me offer something just to begin this discussion. There are two parts of every man's struggle in life. One is to achieve something significant. This is a struggle. This is a struggle. And you can put it in dramatic terms. You can say it's, a, it's why we enter a struggle. Combat represents it most visibly, where we have to battle to achieve our goals, especially our most significant goals. This is the Iliad. Troy is the great goal, the conquering of Troy. Now there are two parts in every man, every person, every man, I speak that generically, of course. Once you've achieved your goal, there is another problem that comes up, and that is how to maintain it, as we might put it psychologically, how to integrate it, or just generally we can have more fun by saying, how to deal successfully with your success. Now, look here now, see? The first part is that we have to go through all kinds of sacrifices in order to reach our most meaningful goals. We struggle, we enter into all kinds of difficulties in order to achieve our goal. During this time, 
during this time necessarily since we sacrificed for this goal, we have theoretically then left our homeland. Right. We've left our home. Even if you are home, literally, if you take on a meaningful goal, you're going to have to sacrifice all kinds of things in order to achieve your goal. In that sense, you left your home, the old way of life. Home is the old way of life. The things that you took for granted, the things that comforted you. Now, after you then achieve your goal, you now have to come back you now have to come back, you have to return home and deal with, how can you now deal with the success you've reached? How can you deal with it going back to the old way of life? Now, here's the problem you see of Agamemnon. He, in fact, sacrificed much to gain his goal, the conquest of Troy. He returned home and he was murdered and by Agesthus. And Orestes, his son, how to gain then revenge for it. Now, why, therefore, is Homer singling out this concern? Well, he has Zeus puzzling over it, meditating on it, because this is the two parts, this is the two parts of the human struggle. How to achieve and how to integrate it. Because during your absence, the home has changed. This has changed. This has changed. Your absence has caused a change. The very absence, leaving the old ways of life, have produced a change because whatever is going on there knows of your absence. So things necessarily have to be restructured just by that alone. So I submit to you that Homer's Iliad and Odyssey deal with these two aspects of life. The Iliad, the first part, the Odyssey, the second part. Therefore, when Odysseus finally gets home, see the struggle to get home, there are two parts. You have to have a struggle to get there, and then once you're there, then you have the difficulty of how do you deal with the changes that have occurred in your absence? So here we have the part here, you see. The first part of the Odyssey is nothing other than this struggle to get home, all the difficulties that he went through to get there, as well as the kinds of changes that were going on during his absence. So we get that. Let's represent that by this line. Now that it has changed, now that he is home, 13th chapter, he now has to deal with this difference, what has gone on in his absence. Well, of course, what has gone on in his absence is that suitors have come into his home, and they now want his, his wife to marry, and they can split the, the great uh, uh, estate of Odysseus. And in order to do that, they have to get rid of the person who was left there, Telemachus, who has now grown to manhood. And therefore, they have to deal with him, and Odysseus has to deal with him, and Penelope has to deal with him. So this latter part, therefore, is how will, know, how will Odysseus now, now deal with this changed circumstances? How will he then test everybody? How will he then do this effectively? What help does he need? Can he do it alone? Or let me even put it this way. You know what's curious about this work? Is that this work announces again and again that at critical points in this story, I'm taking now the Odyssey, I'm taking this as the Odyssey. At critical points in this story, I'm going to represent it this way, at critical points in the story, Odysseus is being helped by Athena, and he doesn't know it. He doesn't recognize it. 
he is being helped, but he thinks he's just his life is being played out and all of the suffering by the indifference of the gods. Now, <laughs> chapter 13, uh, chapter 13, he recognizes, he recognizes Athena. He recognizes her help. He recognizes divine help. Now, he has to now enter into the struggle in Ithaca to regain his status. And he brought with him a vast treasure, greater than the very treasure of Troy, because he was given that by the Phaeacians. Now, can he now do his work with the help of Athena? He recognizes her. He recognizes the fact that she is going to help him. And therefore, we have this team now. Odysseus, the warrior, and Athena, who I will, of course, paint with a different color. And now we have a team. No, we don't have a team. We have to see the role that Penelope plays. This is what we have to see. And I submit to you that the entire story of the Odyssey depends upon Penelope's calculations, her insight into people, her insight to people around her, and the effectiveness to which she can then deal with the tragedies going on around her. And she contributes a basic strategy. Odysseus is called wildly Odysseus, the great strategist, strategician, excuse me, the great strategist. But it's Penelope who actually manages the strategy that makes him successful. Therefore, there are three here. Penelope, active, thinking, powerful understanding of the forces at work. Athena's power helping, but it's her primary role that makes the entire latter part of the story successful. And therefore, I would like to throw it open and to, uh, uh, in any way we can, to push this idea. First of all, have I made it clear enough? All right, now this is, a, this is likely to be a different view of the Odyssey. That's only natural. Right? Because this would indicate, if we are correct in this, that therefore, you see, if she plays this critical role, then we can understand then why the very gods will sing her story for men on earth. Because it is, to my knowledge, the first story that has presented a woman so purely as a thinking, calculating, feeling, fully realized individual. And therefore, if they're going to sing her story for men on earth, then this story must have had a profound impact on Greek society and for the modern reader who reads it this way because it's giving a totally different view of women than we can find in uh, the Garden of Eden with Eve the other way around. Very profound. So, how can we build the case? Barbara? How shall we build this case? <clears throat> you mean, what, what chapters should we look at? Or what what can you contribute, given mm -hmm. this? That might help us along the way. Well, I think her role with the uh, challenge in the end is very clearly key. Although it's kind of jumping. That's okay. With the, with the bow, where she, um, she's she's the one who suggests the the contest and sets the contest up, and that contest puts the bow in the hand of Odysseus, which she would not otherwise have. It arms him. So she sets the, sets the stage, stage for the battle, mm -hmm. right? For the fight with the suitors. 
How, how does she set the stage? She makes the decision for, to have the, the competition that she says doesn't for? matter. For her own for hand. her own wedding. For her own hand. For her own right. Wedding. So yeah. she'll say, "Look here, whoever wins this can have my hand." That's right. And therefore, they all jump to the chance. So she sets the stage or the occasion, right? And in that occasion, the test she gives is to the one that, that Odysseus has often won the past that requires that someone shoot an arrow through a set of um, axe. Heads. Axes. <coughs> Twelve of them, right, in a row, lined up, and he has to shoot an arrow through them all. Using that bow, I think. And is... using his most famous bow as a test of strength as well. So that allows her to set up the stage and give him the weapons he needs, mm -hmm. and the arrows and weapons. Mm -hmm. Ah. Now, would you agree he did not have a plan? He didn't have a plan. For that. All through the story, he admits that he's thinking about it, he's absorbed in how to deal with the suitors, and he has no plan. Right. So she creates the battle plan, she lines up the instruments, she gives him back the bow he needs, so the arrows, gets a position of strength. Mm -hmm. Good. More? More? Well, I think she's also seeking uh, the wisdom of the gods, I think, before she concocts his plan, doesn't she make an offering to she the goddess? Uh, I believe it was Athena, if I remember correctly. And uh, so she beseeches, uh, you know, for help. And then she conceives of the idea. But I think she's also mm -hmm. uh, setting mm -hmm. a strategy even prior to that. I think their strategy begins with uh, the raveling of the, of, of the knots and the yeah. unraveling. Yes, yes. <coughs> she, she has strategy yes. there. Yes. She is a major player. And then she... Yeah, the uh, weaving the web, the, the <laughs> loom, for four years, that was a clever. And then there's a, the discussion with her uh, son, Telemachus, mm -hmm. who's, who's uh, very upset about the suitors uh, pressing her mm -hmm. uh, for the marriage, and he wants to do something, and she, she's telling him, no, we have to have a little more patience. Mm -hmm. She's a moderator. She moderates it, guides him. More, more, good, more. Come on, come well, on. I think uh, yes, yes. you can see a measure of her in, in so far <coughs> as the, when Odysseus goes into the underground and mm. gets um, <coughs> advice about his trip home, he also gets um, a series of women who come up and tell him, in a sense, the origins of their difficulties, which tend to involve gods in disguise, and uh, do they not, and liaisons yes. with gods and things of that nature. Yes, and, book 11. And she's asked to bring that back, uh, Odysseus is supposed to bring that tail back from to his to Penelope, but in the end, it, it appears that she's already taken the <clears throat> message insofar as she, she requires a test of him at the very end to see that he's not, that he is in fact Odysseus and not a god in disguise. So I'm thinking that mm -hmm. she didn't require that tell be brought back from her and therefore mm -hmm. her, her level of understanding is very high. Yes, in Hades, all of the uh, dead go by him, the shades, mm -hmm. and all of the major women in Greek society or Greek history that were seduced by the gods in any one of the forms they took are reviewed and she therefore knows about all of this. So the question is then, how did she escape? Mm -hmm. And she says, does she not? She, mm, well, I know that she tests him. I'm not sure how she escapes, though, other than that. Well, she would you agree him. several <coughs> times she makes the point that she is not going to be persuaded either by some stranger coming to persuade her because she can't trust men. Right. And any appearance that comes, right. she's not going to accept. She's Even though hold he may back. look very much like and has been described as the most like Odysseus, she's That's not right. going to accept that. Because she knows the role that the gods may play. May they may take any disguise to gain their to gain their woman in that sense. Ah. Uh, good. Um, let me, let, let's see whether we can, um, um, 
Would you agree throughout the story the fact that they're, each of them are being tested comes up again and again? Right. Do yes. you have a couple, of, a couple of good ones? Of tests for each one of them? Um, well, isn't the, the battle described as a test for Odysseus or, yes. and Telemachus because Athena doesn't step in and wants to see how well they do before? Let's see. That's I quite know. true. I was thinking of that as a kind of Yeah, well, good, good, yeah, good, good. I mean, it shows that. Let's see if I can find it here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I have it at, um, in this version, which is the Fitzgerald, it's on page 416. And so it's probably maybe 230s or 235 mm -hmm, in book mm -hmm, 22. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it says, um, it's Athena talking, and she says, For all her fighting words, she gave no overpowering mm -hmm. aid, not yet. Father and son must prove their mettle still into the smoky air on the roof. The goddess merely darted to perch on a blackened beam, no figure to be seen now but a, <coughs> a swallow. So she, w she didn't take any part because she wanted to make them prove their courage, prove their capacity yeah. as soldiers before That's she right. would. That's right. It's a test. That's a test. Um. That's a test. Um. Was we all know the great test, the great test that she gives Odysseus in the end with the bed. Oh, true, the test that Penelope gives. The, the test that Penelope gives. That's a great uh, let's even see whether we can see how strong she is in respect to uh, she wants evidence again and again and again to overcome her doubt. Mm -hmm. uh, would you agree? Let's go to that book. That's a good one to go to. Uh, uh, 23, it was after the destruction of all the suitors. They're all slain. And, uh, Euryclea, the, the maid, comes up to waken Penelope, and she says, look here, Odysseus is back, Odysseus is back, he slayed all the suitors. And she comes and she says, Nurse dear, though you have your wits about you, still it is hard not to be taken in by the immortals. Let us join, join my son, though, and see the dead and that strange one who killed them. She turned then to descend the, the stair, her heart in tumult. Had she better keep her distance and question him, her husband? Should she run up to him, take his hands, kiss him now? Crossing the door sill, she sat down at once in firelight, against the nearest wall, across the room from Lord Odysseus. So that expresses her doubt. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you want to hear the um, test part? No, I like that. See, she raises the, the, the possibility in terms of the Greeks that some god has killed the suitors, mm -hmm. right? Sick of the arrogance of man. So therefore she says, look here, how will I know that he slayed them? Mm -hmm. Now where is the evidence? That's right, there's the, that's earlier the end. And the old maid says, you know, you were always mistrustful. And she says, that's right. Mm -hmm. um, Penelope said, nurse, dear, though you have your wits about you, still it's hard not to be taken in by the immortals. Right? Let's join my son, though, and see the dead. She wants to see the dead. And that strange one who killed them. So how did she get over it? Well, she went, she, she tested him, right? At the bottom of that page, it says, she's, she says that uh, there are secret signs we know, we two of them, we two, and... Yeah, could you read the beginning of that paragraph? Sure. I am stunned, child? Yeah. I am stunned, child. I cannot speak to him. I cannot question him. I cannot keep my eyes upon his face. If really he is Odysseus, truly home, Beyond all doubt, we two shall know each other better than you or anyone. There are secret signs we know, we two. A smile came now to the lips of the patient hero Odysseus, who turned to Telemachus and said, Peace, 
Let your mother test me at her leisure. Right. Testing. Before long she will see and know me. Testing is accepted by both. They look forward to it and they test one another. The gods test them. They test one another. Yes, yes. Um, and she'll see and know me best. Agree. Um, um, now, um, I want to also see, while we're doing this, Athena's role. All right, I'm going to see Athena's role. So let's get finished with this testing and then go for Athena's role so we can see what role she plays in the way in which Odysseus and Penelope function together, relate together after they recognize who they are. That's all right? Okay. All right. Um, you're at a good place. You're in book 23. Um, this is her great test. Right, Penelope spoke to Odysseus now, and she said, strange man, if man you are, see, if, hey, if you are a man, maybe you're a god in disguise. There is no pride on my part, nor scorn for you, not even wonder. Merely, I know so well how you, how you appeared boarding the ship for Troy. Say, I knew when you boarded the ship for Troy. I knew, I knew, I knew then. But she's all the same. Then she turns to the, to uh, Euryclea, the maid, and she says, "Make up his bed. Place it outside the bedchamber. My lord built with his own hands. Pile the big bed with fleeces, rugs, sheets, and purest linen." With this, she tried him to the breaking point. See, she tried him to the breaking point, and he turned in a flash of anger. You could read that for us. Woman, by heaven you've stung me now. Who dared to move my bed? No builder had the skill for that, unless a god came down to turn the trick. No mortal in his best days could budget with a crowbar. There is our pact and pledge our secret sign built into that bed, my handiwork and no one else's. An old trunk of olive grew like a pillar on the building plot, and I lay out our bedroom round that tree, lined up the stone walls, built the walls and roof, gave it a doorway and smooth fitting doors. And then I lopped off the silvery leaves and branches, hewed and shaped that stump from the roots up into a bedpost, drilled it and let it serve as model for the rest. I planed them all, inlaid them all with silver, gold, and ivory, and stretched a bed between, a pliant web of oxhide thongs dyed crimson. There's our sign. I know no more. Could someone else's hand have sawn that trunk and dragged the frame away? Their secret. As she heard it told, her knees grew tremulous and weak. Her heart failed her. With eyes brimming tears, she ran to him. No one else knew that that bed was made that way, that he had actually used an olive tree right, and located it and built that as one of the posts of the bed and then from that point made the circumference to build the whole room and the house. So that was the center post. No one else knew, so when she said, just move the bed outside, he said, what? Did you saw that? My bed, the one I made? And of course, since she, uh, he, he knew and she knew that only they knew the secret, that that broke, the, that broke the test and that he passed the test, didn't he? So at that moment then, there's our sign. I know no one, all right? There's our sign. I know no more. Could someone else's hand have sawn the trunk and dragged the frame away? All right, so now she knows. Do not rage at me, Odysseus. No one ever matched your caution. Think what difficulty the gods gave. They denied us life together in our prime and flowering years, kept us from crossing into age together. Forgive me, don't be angry. I could not welcome you with love on sight, 
I armed myself long ago against the frauds of men, imposters who might come, and all those many whose underhanded ways bring evil on. Helen of Argos, daughter of Zeus and Leda, would have joined the stranger, laid with him, if she had known her, where, well, known her destiny. It's really, it's a ne negative case, right? Uh, would she have lain with him if she had known her destiny, known the Achaeans in arms would bring her back to her own country? Surely a goddess moved her to adultery, her blood unchilled by war and evil coming, the years, the desolation, ours too. But here and now, what sign could be so clear as this of our own bed? No other man has ever laid eyes on it, only my own slave, Actorus, that my father sent with me as a gift. She kept our door. You make my stiff heart know that I am yours. Oh. That's right. Right. Um, they don't jump into bed. She has another test, one more trial. He says, hey, you know what? The hour is growing late. It's bedtime. Rest will be sweet for us. Let's lie down. And she says, no, no. That bed, that rest is yours whenever, you, whenever desire moves you. Now, the kind powers have brought you home at last. Kind powers have brought you at home at last. But as your thought has dwelt upon it, tell me, what is the trial you face? I must know soon. What does it matter if I learn tonight? What trial do you face? All right, here's the bed. They can jump into the bed. She says, wait a minute. I want to know where you're at, Odysseus. There's another trial you face. Is there? Let's, let, tell me now before they go to bed. So she wants to know even now. Wait a minute. I don't know whether I'm going to join with you. And so he then has to tell the story, doesn't he? And that story is, could you read it for us? My strange one, must you again and even now urge me to talk? Here is a plodding tale, no charm in it, no relish in the telling. Tiresias told me I must take an oar and trudge the mainland, growing from, going from town to town, until I discover men who have never known the salt blue sea, nor flavor of salt meat, strangers to painted prows, to watercraft, and oars like wings dipping across the water. The moment of revelation, he foretold, was this, for you may share the prophecy. Some traveler falling in with me will say, a winnowing fan, that on your shoulder, sir? There I must plant my oar on the very spot, with burnt offerings to Poseidon of the waters, a ram, a bull, a great buck boar. Thereafter, when I come home again, I am to slay full hecatombs to the gods, who own broad heaven, one by one. Then death will drift upon me from seaward, mild as air, mild as your hand, in my well-tended weariness of age. Contented folk around me on our island. He said, all this must come. Penelope said, if the God's grace, age at least is kind, we have that promise, trials will end in peace. So she confided, so he confided in her. She answered, all right. And they came to bed, the lover of old, opening glad arms to one another. The royal pair mingled in love again, and afterwards lay reveling in stories. That's very, very interesting. Hers of the siege, her beauty stood at home from arrogant suitors crowding on her sight and how they fed their courtship on his cattle, oxen, fat sheep, drank up rivers of wine. Odysseus told of what hard blows he had dealt out to others and what blows he had taken, all that story. She could not close her eyes till it was all told. 
And so now he goes through and recounts his entire journey. Right. Last of all with the Fakians. Now, what role did Athena play in this whole story, this conclusion? That's what we have to see. And if we could go to about 250 and 23, line 250 and 23. The rose dawn? Um, I'd like to go back in, in our story to the moment when um, he contrasts her with Helen. She recognizes that he passed the test of the bed and no other man has ever laid eyes on it. Now from his breast into his eyes the ache of longing mounted and he wept at last. His dear wife, clear and faithful in his arms, longed for as they some warmed earth is longed for by a swimmer spent in rough water where his ship went down under Poseidon's blows, gale winds and tons of sea. Few men can keep alive through a big surf to crawl clotted with brine on kindly beaches and joy and joy knowing the abyss behind. And so, here we are, and so she too rejoiced her gaze upon her husband her white arms round him, pressed as though forever. So what are they now? They're together. They're holding on to one another. And could you, could, could you have a section? Let me continue reading. Sure. The rose dawn might have found them weeping still. All right, there they are together. They're holding on to one another. All right. They're holding on to one another. Their tale is being told. Each one tells their story. They're swept up in tears. Right, the emotional impact of all of their, their trials. Go ahead. So Athena comes in at this <clears throat> point. The rose dawn might have found them weeping still had not gray-eyed Athena slowed the night when night was most profound and held the dawn under the ocean of the east. That glossy team, fire bright and day bright, the dawn's horses that draw her heavenward for men, Athena stayed their harnessing. Then said Odysseus, my dear, we have not yet run one through to the end. One trial, I do not know how long, is left for me to see fulfilled. Tiresias' ghost forewarned me that night I should have stood upon the shore of death, asking about my friend's homecoming and my own. But now the hour grows late, it is bedtime, rest will be sweet for us. Let us lie down. To this Penelope replied, That bed, that rest is yours whenever desire moves you. Now the kind powers have brought you home at last. But as your thought has dwelt upon it, tell me, what is the trial you face? I must know soon, what does it matter if I learn tonight? Then this state would have continued all right, there they are together. This state would have continued, but Athena comes in and holds back the night. Mm -hmm. right? Holds back the night, and uh, Athena stayed there harnessing. Then said Odysseus, "Hey, I got to tell you about this trial." Mm -hmm. So now a dialogue takes place between them. A recollection takes place between them. This holding back the night, right? a recollection takes place. They now recover their past, they share their past. They share their past. And that was occasioned by Athena's interrupting the, the weeping, holding back the night, 
and that allowed there for the telling of the, tr the further trial that Odysseus has to face. Is that right? Make sure. Mm -hmm. Right? What does that show us? She's playing a critical role. And that she thinks it's important that they have the, the recollection and the dialogue. Since that's what they did with the time, it would seem like. This, is, this, this story, therefore, is saying something important about men and women. If this is a story that's going to come down through the ages, they could have stayed there crying in a kind of a catharsis. And she's creating the condition for them to recollect and to share their past together. And therefore, he learns, does he not? And she learns. And she learns, of course, about the trial yet to come. She shares her experiences. Um, Now, the conclusion at the end of uh, 23, right, as they finished telling their stories, other affairs were in Athena's keeping, waiting until Odysseus had his pleasure of love and sleep. The gray-eyed one bestirred the fresh dawn from her bed of paling ocean to bring up daylight to her golden chair, and from his fleecy bed Odysseus arose. So she created the conditions, is that not what it says? Right, waiting until Odysseus had his pleasure of love and sleep, the gray-eyed one bestirred the fresh dawn from her bed of paling ocean to bring up the golden chair, the day, the sun. And he said to Penelope, another reading. My lady, what ordeals have we not endured? Here waiting you had your grief, while my return dragged out my hard adventures, pitting myself against the gods' will, and Zeus, who pinned me down far from home. But now our life resumes. We've come together to our longed-for bed. Take care of what is left me in our house. As to the flocks that pack of wolves laid waste, they'll be replenished. Sc scores I'll get on raids, and other scores our island friends will give me till all the folds are full again. This day, I'm off up country to the orchards. I must see my noble father, for he missed me sorely. And here is my command for you, a strict one, though you may need none, clever as you are. World, world will get about as the sun grows higher of how I killed those lads. Go to your rooms on the upper floor and take your women. Stay there with never a glance outside or a word to anyone. Fitting cuirass and sword belt to his shoulders, he woke his herdsmen, woke Telemachus, ordering all in arms. They dressed quickly, and all in war gear sallied from the gate, led by Odysseus. Now it was broad day, but these three men Athena hid in darkness, going before them swiftly from the town. Right. So then, Athena created the condition for the dialogue and the recollection and then acknowledges the fact that she then created the condition for their love and finally for their sleep. And therefore we have her playing. Uh, what do you want to say that did for the relationship? Matured it? Deepened it? Brought them together from that point on? That is going to be their high point in their life. Mm -hmm. So at the high point in their life, when they finally get together, it's a time to know oneself, right? And she provided the very conditions for that knowing. Ah. So, uh, I'm going to risk a word at this point. Um, what is she bringing them to see? The value, the significance, 
of this kind of a relationship, this kind of mature relationship of sharing and discussing the most important things about them, even their trials that are yet to come. The word I'm going to risk is, um, did she create the conditions for them to, here's the word, treasure their relationship? Did she ennoble, did she ennoble that relationship, right, ennoble, right? did she ennoble it, did she bring them to realize the significance on even a higher level than they had before, did she take this moment when they finally do get together and brought it into a high realization, because from this point on, they can always reflect on that night. So that can become the model. Now, good heavens, we left book 13 all behind, didn't we? Let's go to 13. <coughs> book 13. And Porky's Cove. I'm at a line... Uh, probably 3.30. Odysseus is finally in Ithaca. He doesn't recognize it. And uh, he finally, Athena comes and they have a talk. He, she appears like a youth. And finally, after a several talks back and forth, she says, look here, you know, you're so crafty. He said, oh, you, we, we're two of a kind, we are contrivers both. Uh, my own fame is for wisdom among the gods and deception too. Would you have not guessed that I'm Pallas Athena, daughter of Zeus, that I uh, am that, I'm always with you in times of trial, a shield for you in battle? I'm the one who made the uh, Phaeacians befriend you. And now I'm here again to counsel with you. But first, let's put away those gifts the Phaeacians gave at your departure. Now, let's take a look at this. Um, there are two descriptions of the cove. And I'll take the one now that she's telling Odysseus at 3.30. Now I shall make you see the shape of Ithaca. Here is the cove the sea lord Porky's owns. There is the olive spreading out her leaves over the inner bay. And there the cavern dusky and lovely, hallowed by the feet of those immortal girls, the Nades. The same wide cave under whose vault you came to honor them with Hecticombs. And there, Mount Neon, with his forest on his back. She then dis she dispels the mist so that all the island stands out clearly. So he kisses the earth and he realizes he's home. Now, what does it mean? Now I shall make you see the shape of Ithaca. Now, I want to go back to the prior description of it, which was first given in the beginning of the story. Because this is a rather interesting place in the actual description at line approximately 90 or 100. He finally lands there at the cove the first time he reaches Ithaca. This is the time when he reaches Ithaca. Not the first time he, he nearly reached there and the wind blew him away. When on the east the sheer bright star arose that tells of coming dawn, the ship made landfall and came up islandward in the dim of night. Porky's, the old sea baron, has a cove here in the realm of Ithaca 
two points of high rock breaking sharply hunched around it, making a haven from the plunging surf that gales at sea rolls shoreward. Deep inside at mooring range, good ships can ride unmoored. There on the inmost shore, an olive tree throws wide her boughs over the bay. Nearby, a cave of dusky light is hidden for those immortal girls, the nadies. Within are wine bowls, one, hollowed in the rock. Amph amphoria, two. Bees bring their honey there, three. And their looms of stone, great looms, whereupon the weaving nymphs make tissue richly dyed as the deep sea. And the clear springs in the cavern flow forever. Of the two entrances, one on the north, allows descent of mortals. But beings out of light alone, the undying can pass by the south. No men come there. So it's an interesting place. There's a cave there, two entrances. One, man can mortals. Mortals can, des can descend. But beings out of light alone, the undying or the immortals, can pass by the south. It's a junction. It's a junction. Heaven, earth. It's a junction. There are two, two gates, north and south. The immortals can descend through this cave, through this entranceway, and enter into the cove. And the other men can, or mortals can enter. Men cannot enter the, these beings of light, but he says beings of light alone. Now, this is then where they take the treasure of Odysseus that he gained from the Phaeacians, and they put it at the roots of the olive tree. So she, she uh, puts it there and later moves it into this cave. This is, and she alone goes into the cave. So there's a great treasure then that is then placed in this cave. And this cave is where beings of light attend. So that the result of this entire voyage and this ordeal that he went through, he comes back with a treasure. More valued and valuable than the very treasure he gained from the sacking Troy. That marks the end of his struggles. He's now home. He now has a vast treasure, two treasures. Athena helps him here to get that treasure, and we find in the language we've been using before, a second treasure, a human treasure. So now he has two. And I dare say, I think we know which one is the more valued. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Because that becomes a model for the entire Hellenic race and on into the future. So would you not agree? Even to this day, what are we doing? We're still singing the song, right? We're singing her story for men on earth. That's what we're doing. So we're continuing that tradition, aren't we? The very gods themselves will sing her story for men on earth. And we, people now who can get into the work, we're singing her story for men today. And so there are two stories and two songs, the Iliad and the Odyssey. The one from Troy, that's a song that should make right all the gods work, weaving ruin there. They did it. They played a role in that whole Troy. So it became an archetype. So it should make a song for men to come. So mankind then can learn from this or what it takes to succeed in this terrible journey, right? Gaining what's most important to you. But it's interesting, what I like about the story of the Iliad and its contrast with the Odyssey is on this side, the hero is a son of God. He's a son of Thetis. Odysseus is not. He's a mortal. Father and mother, both mortals. And this becomes, for me, the great event of how to return back and bring back with you the honor, the glory, the test, your mastery. And therefore, the work is really a great work on mindfulness. And that's what I wanted to share tonight. 
Let me open it up for exploring more questions or exploring points. Mm -hmm. Could we in interpret this Using, uh, using this as a model in a sense that uh, uh, it could be like the origin of man as being having more of the godlike qualities when he uh, incarnates and becomes mortal and has mortal parents. Mortal this parents. is his struggle to regain his, his uh, back to the godhood, let's say. Uh, his immortality. He has it, but he doesn't know it. Well, in this story, um, Odysseus was given the opportunity for immortality, and he gave it up. Because? Because if he would have stayed Cal with... Calypso? He, he, she would have given him immortality. He would have given him eternal As well life. as you. Yeah, right? immortal life, yes. Youth and immortal life, yeah. Yes, but he wouldn't have had the uh, more of the experience of conquest of the trials. That's right. He would have had immortality, but he wouldn't have been wise. Right. Yeah. As a matter of fact, that's an interesting thing because um, in the beginning of the story, um, Zeus Zeus looks upon Odysseus and says he's the wisest of the men. All the other men are half as wise as Odysseus. So he's favored because of that status that he has. But curiously enough, someone has a greater wisdom than he. <laughs> Penelope was able to bring it about. <laughs> so in the end, it's a that they become heroes. In the odd in the Iliad, he is a hero. Achilles is a hero. Single, solitary. Here they both are heroes. They join forces with the divine. And interesting, is it not true, that at this point, that key point is where he, for the first time, recognizes that the divine is playing a role in his struggle. Well, I'm actually putting it in the wrong place. It's chapter 13. It's right here. <laughs> That's between the Iliad and the Odyssey. So at 13, right in the middle of it, it's when he recognizes the role that the gods are playing. Uh, Perhaps we have to push this and say, if we we're going to push it adagogically, we would say that we have to realize the role of the, the divine when we are playing out this drama in our own lives. And that the people we can get help from might be the people closest to you. That's quite a chief, that's quite a, that's quite a lesson. Uh, mm -hmm. See, I, I, I see the, the combination of Ulysses and Penelope is possibly uh, a unification, you know, of, uh, of a former androgynous being oh. separated and then combined mm -hmm. again mm -hmm. with the experience, uh, the human experience, uh, going through the tests and trials. Mm -hmm. And so that he, he becomes more than what he started out. Uh, going back to the um, Iliad, because our hero in, in the Iliad, like uh, Achilles, uh, well, doesn't have mm -hmm. the uh, com combination of the female aspect. No, uh, Penelope is missing there. Her, yeah, yeah, there's no there's no parallel. female aspect. There's no female aspect in the Iliad. Yeah, right, but certainly but, this is paramount. But when you get to the uh, the Odyssey, the unification. Uh, as you talk, uh, where they describe their trials, it could be like an integration of the male and female trials integrating, so that they they form as a as a unit. Even though they're still individuals, they have the benefit. And he still has another trial to to perform. Right. He right. still owes he still owes Tiresias. Yeah, he still owes Tiresias. The, the, the completion of the vow, as it were, yeah. Um, what I enjoy about this issue, whether he's fully integrated or not, is in the last chapter, they, the, the father, 
Telemachus, Odysseus, and the Swiner, they go out to battle once more, the villagers, and Athena has to blow the whistle. She says, hey, you've had enough. No more battle. Come on, end it. They say, Whew, okay, no more battle. They don't have to kill anyone else. So in that sense, there's still warriors in the end. What does that suggest? I think for me it suggests that uh, um, the divine should continue to play a role in your existence. Even after you get home and everything is solved, the divine is still going to continue to be required, play a role. Is there any kind of significance to the concept where Penelope is having to be concerned about the immortals tricking her also? There's a divine aspect of trickery there. Are they coming to her as Odysseus? Are they wanting to enter? See, when he went to Hades, yeah, when he went to Hades um, and met his mother, his mother is far more beneficial to his growth and development in what she tells him and what she tells him to do than Tiresias, who was the great sage who was in Hades. But um, what's interesting about that episode in Hades is that all of these people pass in front of him and he judges them. And his mother says, now you have to take this back and tell Penelope. All right, now what does that mean? That means then that Penelope and Odysseus know. As a matter of fact, after this event, he's called the, the twice mortal. Twice mortal is one of the titles Odysseus gets because he descended into Hades and came back. He died twice mortal, going into Hades, symbolically death. But um, she had a great insight, and it was verified by Odysseus going into Hades, that all of these women had gotten all of this difficulty by taking on, accepting the appearance of various things and didn't see the reality that the god was really there taking on an alternate shape, that she was not fooled because she refused to accept any appearance of anything other than her husband being real. That was her, that was her, her purity. She, she held out. She said, look, there's only one person I want to relate to, and he has to prove to me that that's he, that is him, that is he. And I think it may even go further than that. Um, she doesn't want to see whether or not he is the same man. She wants to make sure he has the same state of mind when he returns. And how would you, how do you see that? Well, um, why didn't she just jump into bed after she recognized that he could, he passed the test there, recognizing that that bedpost was the olive tree? Why didn't the story end there? Why wasn't it over? Hmm. Oh, look, what? Huh? Because she, she, Hmm. And she's looking for the to see if there's an emotional response still there, I think. No love until she hears, but as your thought has dwelt upon it, right? But as your thought has dwelt upon it, tell me, what is the trial you face? I must know. Right? I must know soon. Right? I must know. Well, she now knows the trial. She now, she either can reject him after telling the trial, or she can accept that that trial fits into where she sees him and herself. Mm -hmm. She has one more test. There's um, a difference that I detect between the Iliad and the Odyssey, and, and maybe it's just a, from the version that I, you know, that I read, which are not by the same same, two, same authors. Uh, but <clears throat> the idea is that the Iliad has this 
um, it's a kind of conflict between Zeus and the individual's uh, fate, you know, their destiny. That's right. And there's this interplay where the gods uh, say, you know, they say, well, we should do this, mm -hmm. but Zeus says, no, because this person is fated for something. And I didn't get that sense in the Odyssey so much. That's not as strong. And Zeus does, Zeus knows everything. He knows the fate of Odysseus quite early in the story and reveals it. Right. Whereas that isn't true with Achilles since he has to hold up the golden scales of right. fate to determine it. So there's, yeah. th there's, uh, there's this uh, sense of, uh, this lack of the sense of this struggle between the gods yeah. over the individual's fate and what they can do. The story focuses more on, yeah. I think, the test and the trials. Quite true, uh, quite true. And, and, and of it. Yeah. Yes, quite true. Just to conclude that last point we were on, it's after that event uh, of the telling of the trial that he has to face that Penelope then says, right, if by the God's grace age at least is kind, we have that promise, trials will end in peace. That ends it for her. Mm -hmm. But there she's checking his state of mind. Is still, is still part of this point that you're making? She's trying to see where his state of mind is? Well, she does that several places. Um, uh, let's see if I can give you the best place I know of. Um, I, and even if he is Odysseus, she may still not choose to re yeah. return to the relationship mm -hmm. because he has, he's not in a, a stable she says condition it. or something. So, uh, um, um, she has that great, um, uh, Penelope says, strange man, if man you are, this is no pride on my part, no scorn for you, not even wonder. Merely, I know so well how you, how you appeared boarding the ship for Troy. I know how you appeared. Now let's, let's see whether we can make that test. Because the question would be, why didn't she uh, come down, see all these, she was, she uh, had evidence that the suitors were slain, that he had played the role in it. Why does she have to keep testing him? She knows it's him now. She calls him her husband on the top of... Oh good, could you read that? Body. Well, she said, well, she says, had she better keep her distance and question him, her husband, right? Mm -hmm. And so it seems like that quote states that she did see him that he was her husband, but that wasn't sufficient. She still had to test him. So, right, she says he's most like her husband. And in any case, she still has the question, if he really is Odysseus truly home, beyond all doubt we two shall know each other better than you or anyone. I guess the, the point I was making was that she calls in that quote, she's calling him her husband yes. in her inner reflections. Yeah. Yeah. Yet she still tests him. That's before any of the testing yeah. goes on. Yeah. So it's as if it's not enough that he's simply returned home the same physical person that he yeah. was. So she wants to see if his that the Odysseus in a could be put this way that the Odysseus that she knew came home. You know that the person or or, or, or that state of that mind. Yeah, that. and grew from that state of mind, but not different in a lesser sense. Yeah, yeah. And they okay. know, because. Yeah. Because he did pass the test by knowing their secret, yes. and that's that's interesting. Okay, I think we're have to wind it down. I enjoyed it. Thank you Thank for letting you. me share it with you. Thank you. Good. <clears throat>